evaluation form. And if you would please take a few minutes and complete that evaluation form, um, your feedback is is very important and, and very much appreciated. Uh, we're looking for your uh, comments and the way this session may or may not have been helpful for you. We're also looking for any ideas you may have to improve um, uh, this whole series of webinars and any topic areas you'd like to explore in the future. So that's the agenda for today. If we move to the next slide, my intention you know, is really to have, uh, to have you all kind of reflect on when you came away from a meeting sometime and you felt like this was the best meeting ever, what were some of those ingredients? What were some of the things about that meeting that made it the absolute best meeting? And I don't think we can do this because of the technical problem, but, but I would just ask you to reflect on that. What are some of the things that make meetings really effective? What are the ingredients that go into making a good meeting? I think that you will probably find as you reflect on that that there are some things that are really tangible. For example, people respond to this question often by saying, well, it began on time, or the facilitator moved the meeting along at a good pace. Um, other, other responses tend to be less tangible. Uh, sometimes people say there was just good energy in the meeting, or the, the, uh, we had a good feeling in the meeting. It felt like everybody was, was, was kind of connected. So as you think about best meetings ever, thinking about those kind of uh, components that go into it, uh, some of them are tangible and that you can see them actually, and some kind of intangible, you know they're there, you can feel their presence. If we move to the next slide, uh, I think what you'll find is that there are a, a, a couple things will emerge. And one is when you look at meetings are effective, you find that people spend more time in the future tense rather than the past tense. Um, the idea of having your meetings more future oriented. If there's one thing you take away from the webinar today, that's probably the most valuable. If you reflect back, back on a, any particular board meeting you've had recently and ask the question, how much time did we spend talking about things that happened already versus how much time did we spend talking about what we're planning on doing? And I would submit that the more time you spend in that future tense, the more energized you will feel, the more effective the meetings will be because people will feel like they're really making a difference. Uh, another way to think about it is to think about looking at a rear view mirror and a windshield. And the rear view mirror is much smaller than the windshield and part of your work as a board member is to be looking in the rear view mirror, but the, but the greater part is to be looking out the front window, which is broad, which is really giving you a sense of where you're going. And a third way to think about this would be to think about your responsibilities as a board really fall into two categories. You're monitoring or you're steering. And the less time you spend monitoring in a board meeting, the better. The more time you spend steering, the more effective your board meetings will be. And so you want to do your best to get monitoring out of the boardroom or to minimize the amount of time you spend monitoring. And monitoring is another term for oversight, so you think about it that way. If we move to the next slide, uh, what I did was to kind of lay out what I see as some characteristics of effective meetings, simply as a way to kind of benchmark perhaps your board meetings. So if you look at effective meetings, some of the some things you will find uh, pretty consistently. Meetings that are effective, they begin and they end on time. People know that when the time comes to get started, we roll up our sleeves and we begin, and when the time comes to end, things wrap up. People coming to board meetings are very busy. They've got a lot of other things in their lives. And so it really is a respectful thing to do to take the, the time that we spend together in a meeting, put a beginning and end on it, and to try your best to stay disciplined to following that. Meetings uh, that are really effective always have clearly stated objectives. People know what they're setting out to accomplish when they sit down at the meeting. Um, effective meetings. They, people in the meeting focus on the important issues, the really big issues, the issues that really matter for your organization. Um, we find that background information gets distributed in advance. So typically you'll get a packet of information prior to a board meeting. Getting it in advance and having an opportunity to review it before the meeting is a great idea. Uh, regular use of meeting evaluations. Uh, I am always surprised when I ask folks if they evaluate their meetings how very few people actually do. It's always a good idea to build in some time to evaluate your meetings. And if you evaluate your meeting, if you evaluate any particular meeting and you do it well, the next meeting will be better 
And if you do that as a practice, every subsequent meeting will be more and more effective. Um, a characteristic of effective meetings is that members come prepared. People have done their homework. Um, they don't walk into the room and then start reading the board packet. They, they come prepared. They've read the packet already. There's a written record. It's another characteristic of an effective meeting. There, there, there are people who will say if there's no written record, there was no meeting. So a written record, and for the most part what we're talking about here are minutes, vitally important. Information is presented clearly. Um, people sit down at a table. If the executive director has some issue he or she wants to present, it's got to be presented in a very clear way. People have to understand what it is we're looking at, why we're looking at it, what it is we're supposed to do with this information. Members have opportunities to ask questions and to discuss issues. So you have to build your meetings and structure them in such a way that there's ample time for people to discuss and ask questions. And at the same time, you still have to move along and bring questions and issues to some resolution. Uh, the chair keeps the group on task is another characteristic of an effective meeting. And finally, and maybe most importantly, an effective at the end of an effective meeting, if decisions have been made, everybody understands what they are. Decisions are made and they're understood. If you've ever walked out of a meeting and you hear yourself saying, I thought we decided this, and somebody else said, oh, no, I thought we decided that. When you, when you hear those kind of conversations, that's a good indication that something wasn't clearly defined or understood. Uh, and it's an important, it's an important thing to get that right and to get that captured in the minutes. So those are just simply some characteristics of meetings that are effective. And if you look at your board meetings, you can, you can use this kind of uh, slide as a uh, benchmarking exercise and just say, well, what, how do our meetings compare? Do our members come prepared, for example? When we end our meetings, are decisions made and understood? Those are good questions to ask. If we move to the next slide, planning meetings. Um, a, a general thought about planning a meeting and something that I see people often get, um, get re reversed. When you begin planning a meeting, the most effective way to begin a meeting, uh, planning, is to begin with the objectives. You simply ask the question, what do we need to accomplish? Once you've determined what needs to be accomplished, those are your objectives, then you can look at the agenda. And the agenda is simply how we're going to allocate time and in what sequence are we going to put these items so that um, we can, so we know what we're going to accomplish and we sequence them and allot time to them. So for example, if there were three major objectives for a meeting, you might allocate 20 minutes to each objective. So that's a, a way to think about it. And often people confuse objectives and agenda. And they really are two different things. And so if you think about the cart and the horse analogy, the objectives is the horse. You put the horse first. Uh, so just some thoughts on planning meetings. Um, the other thing I want to just say about planning meetings, especially board meetings, is that um, one of the most effective ways to do that, and I'm sure many of you do this already, is that the board leader or the board chair and the executive director sit down a couple of weeks ahead of time and really begin thinking about what are the objectives for our upcoming board meeting? What is it that we need to accomplish? What is it that we need to do that has to be done in this meeting and cannot be done in any other way? And from that conversation, you then start crafting your objectives. That's a good time to get an email out to everyone on the board and simply say, these are the objectives we're setting out for our board meeting coming up in a few weeks. Please give us some feedback. Does this look like we're covering the right things? Is there something we're missing here? Is there something we should be attending to that we're not? So that's just an, a, a comment on how um, how to plan uh, a, a meeting and how to bring the whole board into that planning process. And when you invite input from other board members, you, you not only get their best thinking and preparing and planning a meeting, but you also start building some ownership. Uh, they, be get, they get more invested in a meeting when they find that they're invited to be part of the planning of it. If we go to the next slide, this is a slide as an example. If you um, and I've seen boards use this framework, where they're, they're, this will work if you have a board where you've got a really good strategic plan, um, and it's designed in such a way that if you have a strategic plan in place, the plan itself can be your standing agenda. So you may have four broad strategic goals in your plan. Uh, they really become your agenda. 
and any business that the board needs to attend to at any particular board meeting would have to fit under one of those goals. And if it doesn't fit, then it's probably not the board's business. Or if you want to make it your business, you would need to create a new goal. The benefit to having this kind of a structure is that it's a way to keep your strategic plan alive, a way for it to still con to continue bringing value and being useful to you. And it's also a way to remind everyone on the board that, that what we're doing in any particular board meeting is connected to a bigger picture. So this is an example that I share with you that I've seen that works well, particularly where there is a really good strategic plan and a planning process in place already. If we go to the next slide, I'll share with you here a sample of an agenda. And I thought it would be helpful to just use an example. So here's an example of an agenda and a few things I'll point out to you. And if um, Chelsea or um, Kimberly can move the cursor around, please do that and, and direct people's attention to certain parts of this particular slide. One of the things um, you notice about this slide is that down the left-hand column, t there are time allotments. And it pretty much uh, lays out, uh, in the planning process, you make some decision about the issues you're going to deal with and how much time you think you might need to allow for them. Having the time allotments listed on an agenda is a really good way to help share responsibility for moving the meeting along. Uh, when you know you have a limited amount of time to talk about a particular issue, everyone can share responsibility for, for minimizing their comments or not repeating things. Um, for trying to help everybody stay within the time frame. Um, the other thing about this agenda, as you look at it, is over on the right-hand column, uh, I stated the purpose of the agenda item. So if we walk across the very first one, the, at 8 a.m., the agenda item is a welcome and an introduction, and the board chair is the person who has the lead responsibility for this particular agenda item. And you have now 10 minutes for the purpose of setting the tone of the meeting. So that first uh, row really lays out the time the meeting begins, the allotted time, what the agenda item is, who's going to take lead responsibility, and what the purpose behind that agenda item is. The purpose column is, is a really helpful way to take what some people may assume already and just make it much more explicit. So if we look at another example, let me walk down here a little bit more. If we look down at, um, let's go down to say 820, uh, State of the Agency. So this is a, um, a, an agenda that comes from about halfway through the fiscal year. And um, in this agenda, the planners have set aside some time for the executive director to take a little time to share with the board about where things are at this point, say midway through a year, and how we're doing. And the purpose for that is to make sure the board is informed, which is over in the right-hand column, and also to elicit ideas looking ahead. Um, the next uh, uh, example of the item is, a, is another one to look at, again, just extracting a few here for, for learning purposes. Um, at 845, this board is going to discuss some new initiative, some new project or program. And the lead responsibility for that goes to the executive director, or perhaps it might be the director of programs, but whoever is the appropriate person to lead this discussion. And then in that discussion, there will be some background information, something about this that makes it very timely. Uh, you would ask questions about whether we have the capacity to take on this initiative. Uh, you would ask questions about whether this fits with our mission. So that would be part of the discussion around the new initiative. And if you move over to the right column, the purpose of this discussion is to discuss what our options and implications are for looking at this particular initiative, and then perhaps to determine what the next steps are. So I won't walk through this slide anymore. I put it there as kind of an example of how you can organize your thinking and structure your meetings in such a way that it's clear how much time you have, it's clear what the topic is that's going to be discussed, it's clear who is going to take lead responsibility for that discussion, and it's clear what the purpose of, of this discussion is or what this discussion will lead to. So that's just an example there that I share with you, and you may find that this fits for some meetings and not for others. Um, you may find it, it, it's a good tool to use for all your meetings. It's, it's Whatever you might like to do with this idea, please feel free to do it. 
let's move to the next slide, which is some other ideas about meetings and ways to improve meetings. Um, and I'll walk down these bullet points. So one is that you build in some transition time. It's always helpful when people are coming to a meeting that they have a little time to get to get their minds into the into the meeting. If you're coming from work and you're rushing and you're getting out of your car or getting off a subway and you run into the meeting, you need a little time to come from where you were to where you are. So building in a little transition time is a good idea. Uh, beginning a meeting with a mission moment is a very effective way to begin a meeting. And a mission moment is simply taking a, a few moments at the beginning of a meeting to perhaps reflect on your mission, have somebody read the mission out loud and just reflect on it, to, uh, to ask someone to share a story about something they've observed or experienced since the last board meeting that has to do with your mission. Uh, a mission moment is really a good way to bring people together. And especially when you're going to deal with some issues in a meeting that might be contentious, it's always good to begin by starting with, this is what we all agree on. This is, the, this is what's central. This is what's core to our organization. This is what we're not going to disagree about. We might disagree about the next agenda item, but we're not going to disagree about this. Uh, the third bullet down there, objectives begin first, and then you build your agenda. And I've commented on that already. The fourth bullet down, uh, sometimes it's helpful to identify an agenda item as to whether it is a decisional item or an informational item. If, if an issue is being brought before the board, and let's say the executive director is bringing an issue to the board, it's helpful to know whether the executive is just sharing information or whether the executive is looking for the board to make a decision. So looking at your agenda items and identifying them as either decisional or informational is, is a good way to help add more structure to your meeting. And again, it's one of many ways, to, many kind of techniques that you can I invite you to experiment with and try and see what works for you and what doesn't. Uh, allotting times for each agenda item. Uh, some people, for some people, they would say that's really kind of overstructuring things. And the example I shared in the previous slide, that, that's an example of allocating time for each agenda item. Um, it may be overstructuring for some meetings, but it, it better to be overstructured than understructured. Um, it really is an effective way to, to, um, to keep the meeting moving and for people to share responsibility. Assigning a name to each agenda item. If you have an agenda item, let's say it's a financial report, and you put down next to that agenda item the treasurer's name, there's a good chance the treasurer is going to be prepared and, uh, and be ready to do his or her part for that meeting. So assigning a name is another way to share responsibility. Uh, sequence is another thing you might consider when you're building your agenda. You don't have to begin, or you can begin with any particular item you may want to. It's often better to, to begin with your most important items, the bigger issues, to get to them first. Um, that's a way to ensure that you do get to them in case you do run out of time. But sequence is something you could do with intention. You don't automatically have to do it in, in any particular sequence. Taking breaks is something that I find is helpful. If, if, if you're going to be meeting as a board for two hours, it's good to take a break in there at least once and have it be a real break so that people can just kind of refresh their minds and they'll come back and they'll be more productive. Uh, humor is something that's always good to have in a meeting, uh, especially if you're dealing with some contentious issue. A lot of times the issues that urban programs are, are dealing with are very serious issues around people's health. Uh, for example, and um, to interject some humor into discussions, not to make light of things that are serious, but to interject some humor is always a good thing to consider. The silver bullet of the webinar is the next bullet. Evaluate this meeting as the last item. If you build your agendas and you have that, evaluate this meeting as the last agenda item, and you spend 10 minutes at a meeting really evaluating, your next meeting will be better. And if you do it at that meeting, the following meeting will be even better. Uh, it's a way to bring more intention to how the board meets. How do we plan this meeting? How did we, uh, what did we accomplish? Did we accomplish our objectives? And towards the end of the webinar, I'll share some examples of some tools for evaluating as well. Uh, one minute memo is a great technique to use. If you're the board chair and the clock is running out and it's time to wrap up, 
uh, and you know that there are folks in the room who still want to ask a question or want to make a comment, simply asking them to take out a piece of paper and write you a one-minute memo what it is that you wanted to say tonight that you didn't get a chance to say, or what is the question you wanted to ask that you didn't get to ask, and write it down and pass it up to the board chair, and then he or she can take that after the meeting and look at those questions or comments or whatever they are, and then dispose of them appropriately. It's a good way to stay within your time frame and a good way to respectfully get input from people who feel like they needed to say more. Um, the bullet point around the room being conducive to doing good work is kind of a no-brainer in some ways, but in some ways it really does matter. Uh, if you construct the room in such a way, you set it up so the board members can see each other, so sitting in a, in a rectangle or circle uh, or horseshoe, uh, having a table to write on or to have computers on, um, it's always helpful to have that in place. Time of day is a consideration. Um, Many people believe that the, the most effective time to have a board meeting is first thing in the morning when people are fresh. That's not always practical or possible. If you have a meeting and it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that's the end of the day, so you have to consider that and find some ways to, uh, to accommodate that. Uh, refreshments, it's always good to have something there for people to nibble on or drink. And finally, keeping in mind that people, how people learn and how people function, you, you know, we, it, because you have two hours, it doesn't mean you can cram four hours worth of business into it People and do it at, at a high speed. People can only learn at a certain pace and in a certain way. And on, in any board, you're going to find people who learn in different ways and have different styles of learning um, and function in different ways and have different styles. And people have different knowledge levels in discussing any particular issue. So just kind of keeping, keeping that in mind as you plan your meeting and as you allocate the time for your different agenda items is a good idea. If we move to the next slide, please, um, and just take a minute to look at structure of meetings. Um, again, they're designed to be productive engaging and, and to focus on substantive issues. You're bringing board people together who are very busy people. They have a lot to offer. What they need from you is to have the structure and the plan in place so you can really tap into their best thinking. Some other ideas. Um, being sure that you're framing really good questions for your board meetings. Um, make sure you're asking good questions. And if you're not sure you are, check in with the whole board. Uh, when you evaluate your meeting. Preparation, again, I, I can't say enough about that. The better prepared you are for a meeting, the more valuable the meeting will be. The use of dashboards, uh, simple kind of tools to give board members a kind of visual picture of information that they need at one point in time where they can simply look at it and grasp it and understand it and not require a lot of reading or a lot of discussion. Having a calendar of meetings is, is uh, something that folks find very helpful. And by calendar of meetings, I'm talking about an annual calendar where you might have, for every quarter of the year, you may have the key board business items listed. So in the first quarter, it'll be to uh, do a performance review of the executive director. In the second quarter, one of the major items will be the, your board retreat or your board training sessions. The fourth quarter of, the, of your um, on your calendar would be um, the, prove the, the budget for the following fiscal year. But taking the year and kind of blocking it into quarters and then adding to those quarters those major business items that will come before the board. It's a good idea and a good way to structure meetings and keep, keep in people's minds the idea that we're meeting over a whole year and this is our workload spread out over the year. Um, having some kind of pre-reading or reports is something that uh, people might find helpful. And then last bullet I put here is um, inviting guests or facilitators, bringing in somebody from outside to talk about a particular issue is another way to kind of enrich your meetings and, um, and help board members learn more and more about particular issues, especially when you're talking about health, health issues, which can be very complicated. Uh, and if you don't have a lot of medical people on your board, your board still needs to understand basic issues around healthcare and healthcare finance. So, so bringing in folks, just bringing in different people, people who are interesting, who are good presenters, is a good way to kind of keep your meetings alive and energized. Um, so that's a, uh, the structure of meetings. If you move to the next slide, please. 
Um, I want to talk for a minute about minutes. Uh, and let me reiterate again that minutes, and this may be kind of basic, but I think it's worth going over. The, your minutes of your meeting are really important. They are the written record of the meeting. They are the written record of what the board decides. They have legal weight. Um, minutes are not transcriptions. It's not a word-for-word -word accounting of what happened in a board meeting. They are not intended to replace uh, to use a substitute for somebody not missing for somebody missing a meeting if someone misses a meeting the minutes will help them understand what were the major decisions um, but if you really want folks to be briefed on what the meeting was really like somebody has to do that person to person with the phone call or, or over a cup of coffee but minutes are very important and so some things about minutes uh, that that are the basics here is in your minutes, you should, there should be the name of the organization, obviously, the date and the time of the meeting, the board members who were, intended, who were in attendance, those who were excused and those who were absent, so you have a record of who is participating, um, that you need to have a quorum as defined by your, by your board, um, by your bylaws, um, that minutes should really lay out action steps so that a motion is made and by whom, um, that there's a brief account of, of the debate or the discussion, and then what was the result of the vote, if a, if a vote was taken, if there was a board action. So, so that needs to be very explicit and can be stated in kind of bullet points in your minutes. Uh, and again, it's not a transcription of everything that was discussed. It's really highlighting the major points. Uh, another bullet here, reports and documents are introduced. Uh, sometimes um, if you're looking at some different documents you might just simply footnote that in your minutes and have them as attachments to the minutes. Future action steps are laid out. Um, the time that the meeting ended is important to put in your minutes. That's when the, the, the uh, legal and formal work concluded. Um, having your minutes signed by the secretary or chair um, or both perhaps, but, but having a signature saying these minutes have been approved by the board um, and then getting them distributed um, within three days or within a very short period of time. It's important to get minutes out as quickly as possible because very often in the minutes there's work to be done leading up to the next meeting and the sooner people have the, those minutes, um, the more, better informed they will be in terms of the work that they have coming up. So those are just some quick thoughts about minutes that I'd share with you. Um, and let me again just reiterate that if you do have questions or comments about anything that I'm talking about here, please do connect me with me through my email address and I will respond within 24 hours. Um, the next slide, if you could move to the next slide please, is called Keeping It Civil. Um, just some thoughts, some ideas about how to ensure that the meeting is, is one where people are, um, are respectful of each other and I know themselves. Um, arriving on time and staying until the end of the meeting is, is really something that's expected of every board member. Now things happen, you know, if you are going to be late for some reason, a simple professional courtesy is to let someone know. If you have to leave a meeting early, letting the chairperson know ahead of time, you simply say, you know, something important came up, I have to leave early. So it's not so much being rigid about arriving on time and staying until the meeting ends. It's about being courteous and, and, and following a really good professional et uh, etiquette around that. Coming prepared to meetings. Uh, avoid making judgmental statements. You, you're really not in that boardroom to be judgmental. You're there to make judgments, perhaps, but to not be judgmental. Um, one of the ways that you want to keep things civil is to stay as focused on the issues as you can rather than people. So it's not about any particular person. We really have to focus in this meeting on what the issues are. Don't speak all at once. Uh, this is, depends on the kind of folks you have on your board, but I've served on some boards where, where there are a lot of talkers and we all want to speak and we all got something to say. Uh, it really requires some discipline, you know, individual discipline to, to hold back and try to listen more and speak less. Um, don't criticize those who are absent. I mean, there's no, no benefit to criticizing people. There's only negative things that will come from that. Don't monopolize the conversation. Um, 
it's important for everyone in the boardroom, everyone in the meeting, to take responsibility for their own behavior and for keeping the meeting moving along. If you tend to be a person who speaks a lot, and I am one of those folks for sure, I have to share some responsibility about regulating myself. I need to have an awareness that, okay, I'm talking too much, or I need to just kind of discipline myself to, to do a little more listening and a little less speaking. Um, ask clarifying questions. Uh, it's really good to invite clarifying questions very specifically. So if you're discussing a particular issue, rather than simply say, open it up and say, oh, who has questions, you might begin by saying, okay, let's begin with clarifying questions. Who has questions that, um, that have to do with needing more information? Keep confidential information confidential. I mean, if you're having discussions in the boardroom and it's confidential, it requires everyone to honor the, the the idea of being respectful of people's privacy and respectful of the confidentiality of discussions in the boardroom. Talk about board issues in the boardroom, not in the hallway or in the parking lot. Um, this is a really key point. You know, if you uh, have some issue and you want to discuss it out of the boardroom and it should be discussed in the boardroom, you simply have to not do that. And if you happen to be walking out of the boardroom and somebody else approaches you and starts talking to you, you, you cannot listen. You, it's your responsibility to say, this is not appropriate. If you don't talk about it, we, don't, we should be talking about this in the boardroom. Not, we should not be talking in the hallway. Uh, you really don't want to get into any kind of pattern around this. But the, the, you want those issues to be surfaced in the boardroom. Even if that may be a little difficult or might make people uncomfortable, it is the only place where they can be addressed um, in any kind of a constructive way. Uh, recognize when there's a conflict of interest and disclose it to the group. Uh, and if you're not sure whether there's a conflict, simply disclose that I think there might be or I'm not sure if there is and get some input from the board on it. And finally, and kind of throughout all of this about keeping it civil, is sharing responsibility. Keep in mind all the time that this is our board, that we are all here together for a common purpose. Um, we've made promises to each other uh, and, and uh, around how we will work together and how we will treat each other. And we have to share responsibility for all of that. So those are some thoughts on keeping it civil. As we move to the next slide, um, I thought it would be helpful to talk about this because it comes up more and more. Uh, but that's the whole question about devices. And let me qualify this by simply saying I am not a device person. I am a very low-tech person. You could ask Kimberly. She knows that. Um, you have to make some decisions along the way about whether you're going to have devices in your boardroom, in your board meetings, or, or not, or maybe. Um, this is not a black and white issue anymore as it may have been at some point. It really is a moving target and it's a moving target because norms are changing. Norms regarding about when it's okay to have uh, uh, some kind of electronic device in a meeting and when not. And, and it's a moving target in, in the sense that if we were talking just five years ago, you would find that most boards would begin with the board chair saying, please turn off your phones. Now, what typically happens is the board chair will say, please put your phone on vibrate, and please don't take any calls unless you absolutely have to, or some such thing. Um, there are also people who use their devices for taking notes. And uh, again, to, to simply have a black and white rigid rule about devices, it's, not, it's going to interfere with their ability to be productive in a meeting. So my suggestion on all this is to have a discussion with the board about what should be our norms what should be our group's norms around using devices? What do we expect of each other? What are the kind of behaviors that we would feel might be okay and which ones might be offensive, for example? So again, if you haven't discussed devices, it might be worth doing it rather than waiting till you have a problem uh, when it's always harder to deal with things. If we move to the next slide, and this kind of moves along as things are evolving with our technology, but now people are having what we call now virtual meetings, meetings where no one's in a particular room. We're meeting in the, on, through the internet. This webinar is, is an example of a virtual meeting. Um, and so if you do have virtual meetings, there are things you need to consider. And if you're going to have them, you certainly need to be thinking about these things. There are legal issues about virtual meetings. Um, you can use platforms like a teleconference 
telephone, you can use web-based uh, platforms or vehicles or whatever the right term is. Um, but there are ways you can meet without actually being in the room and have them be uh, legal binding meetings. Um, there are pros and cons of having virtual meetings. Uh, the obvious ones are that it's for some people it's more convenient. Um, another thing that I consider on the pro column is that if you are trying to attract younger people onto your board, they tend to enjoy and do well with virtual meetings. Whereas if you if you have a board that's comprised of some older folks like myself, um, it's a little more difficult to get used to the technology. Um, but it's a way, uh, those are the pros, it's a way in which to bring people together who are very busy and still be able to have a meeting. The downsides to virtual meetings are, are the obvious ones that um, it's much, it's very different than sitting with people. Um, uh, you know, in some ways there's compromises made when you have virtual meetings because uh, some work can be done better in person. I've also heard from people that, that have said to me, you know, our, our virtual board meetings are much better. So again, it all depends on, on who you are, what your particular culture is. Um, and what I found working with the, with Native American communities in particular is that uh, virtual meetings are harder to grab onto because um, because in the native communities, people, when you think about a meeting, it's sitting with someone, it's being with someone, um, and not necessarily being long distance and just speaking on a phone. There are special considerations for virtual meetings to keep in mind. Uh, if, you, if you are going to be using a web-based platform of some kind, the board members have to have the competency and the ability to use that technology. Uh, preparation for virtual meetings uh, has got to be done in a particular way. Um, facilitating the meeting, um, if you are facilitating a teleconference meeting or, or a web-based meeting, um, facilitation skills are going to be a little bit different. Uh, you may have to be a little more directive. Um, and engagement, engaging people uh, in a virtual meeting can be difficult. Um, especially if it's a large group of people and um, and so it, as a facilitator you really want to make sure that you're keeping people connected uh, and I'll talk more a little more about that um, I, I would I would invite you to think about uh, well one of my experiences that I, I've heard people say things like you know I had a teleconference call and so the whole time you know the teleconference I sat there and I was checking my emails um, you don't want people to be doing that. You want them engaged because if they're checking their emails, they're not bringing any value and they're not feeling very valued. So it really takes some work if you're in a virtual meeting to get people connected and keep them connected. If we move to the next slide, um, I shared some examples here of some protocols for meetings. And the point in all of this is that if you're going to be meeting, uh, having virtual meetings, to be very intentional about how you're going to do that work. Beginning and ending on time is a good example. Um, very often, a, a virtual meeting, the, the meeting notes will say, the meeting begins at 8 o'clock, please log on 10 minutes early, or please dial in 10 minutes early. It's a way to make sure that when the time comes, you can begin. Um, another uh, simple practice, and I don't know if anyone's ever experienced this, but I certainly have. If you're on a teleconference call, and um, the, the meeting begins and then somebody's a little late and you hear the click noise or the beep and they say, hi, this is me, so-and-so, and without even realizing it, they're interrupting the meeting. So simply by having a, a, a stated protocol where if you, if you come on late, don't interrupt. Just simply be there and be listening until there's a, a, an opportunity, when there's a pause in the conversation or you move to the next agenda item. Pause before speaking. I, I serve on a board now where we have virtual meetings and the board chair uh, came up with this as a protocol and it works very effectively. And She simply says at the beginning of the meeting, if you're going to speak, before you speak, pause. And what that does is it, it, it minimizes the kind of technical interruptions that happen when two people try to speak at the same time and the phone kind of um, they cancels each other out. Um, the other thing that you'll find if you can if you work with this kind of a protocol is that it, the pace of the meeting will be less hectic. The pace will be slower and more deliberate. Uh, it's a it's a technique that I've seen work, and I put it out here just for your consideration. And finally, on this one, if you're a facilitator, 
uh, it really it really requires you to, to be connecting with each individual on the call and so in this example the facilitator would call on specific people just to make sure everybody is engaged so the facilitator may say you know Tony we haven't heard from you in the past few minutes what are your thoughts um, it's a little bit kind of assertive but it's a good way to make sure that you keep people connected so those are some thoughts on virtual meetings and uh, just as a way of bringing more consciousness or more intention to to that kind of a meeting if you do do them or if you're planning on doing them we move to the next slide please and that's just a quick one talking about sunshine laws the idea of sunshine laws these are laws where uh, and they vary from state to state but there are certain requirements for certain nonprofits, if you receive um, public funding, for example, there are certain requirements about your meetings having to be public, um, that having to be uh, open to everyone because you're using public money, and that's the basic rationale behind it. Um, as I said, they vary from state to state, and some examples of, of the issues that would come up is that for um, for some meetings, there may be requirements about the location. Um, about uh, requirements for notification so if you if you receive public funding there may be some requirements in your state where you have to have a public notice in the newspaper saying our board is going to meet at a certain time um, you may have to have other things in place like an interpreter for hearing impaired uh, so there are different kind of examples of um, issues that you may have to deal with in a dealing with sunshine laws um, if you're not certain about this or it's something that you have a curiosity about you simply check with your state and find out uh, if you have a state nonprofit association they'd be a good resource or uh, if you have an attorney on your board they'd be a good resource as well uh, moving on to executive sessions and to just define what I'm talking about here this would be a, a board meeting where at some point the board would meet in private so if there were people from the community or the public in the room they would be asked to leave um, sometimes an executive session would be simply the board members with no staff being present but again it's the idea of meeting in an executive session and these are some examples of circumstances under which you might do that so if you're dealing with some kind of personnel issues that's something very personal private has legal implications that is not something you discuss in public as a board you discuss it in private when the board wants to just talk and board members want to talk peer-to-peer -to, -peer to each other they can do that about how they're working as a board um, typically when uh, when you have a meeting with your finance around financial issues with your auditor that would be something you would do in an executive session you wouldn't involve the public in that uh, preparing for a legal case same thing you wouldn't involve the public in that and I'm, I won't read through all these but these are some examples of times under which you might consider having executive sessions the next slide is a slide that has to do with a consent agenda and I want to mention this because it's a, it's a more it's increasingly a more common practice where um, where when planning your board meeting you would have a consent agenda which is one of your agenda items where there are routine business uh, and it all gets clustered under one agenda item and you entertain a motion in a second and you vote on it without discussion um, it's a way of uh, bringing more efficiency to a meeting a way of getting you more future oriented in your meeting as well um, and the next slide if we can go to that are some examples of what might be in a consent agenda so if it's something minor a minor change in a procedure you would simply have that disposed of all together in a cluster that along with minutes from a previous meeting um, executive director report may be something that's a written two-page report that would be you know under a consent agenda it's not meant to be discussed it's simply meant to inform the board so certain uh, routine items a uh, routine financial report would be another example um, of something you might put in uh, under a consent agenda and again the idea behind it is to is to get the board spending more time in the meeting in the future versus the past um, many of the things that you put in a consent agenda, uh, under a consent agenda are issues that have happened already so it's history already it's past tense uh, it has to do with oversight more than with steering with looking forward so those are some examples of that um, I want to shift the uh, discussion a little bit towards the last 10 minutes here to talk about uh, evaluating meetings so here are some examples where you look at the criteria for for evaluating meetings 
Um, one of the, the aspects of evaluating a meeting was simply to be asked questions about how do they do planning or preparing for the meeting. Uh, another criteria would be, you know, how was the participation? Did it seem like everybody was involved? Did everybody have opportunities to ask questions and to talk uh, um, and to comment? Um, what were the interactions like? What was the climate like in a room? Did it feel like like we were we were in a good place that people felt like they could learn and share comfortably? Uh, or did it feel like it was tense? These are criteria that you can use to ask questions that are evaluative in nature to improve upon your board meeting. Pace is a good question. If you were the chairperson or the facilitator, you'd want to be getting feedback from the board about how did you do pacing the meeting? Did we move too fast? Did we move too slow? Were there parts of the meeting that you wished I had I had taken a little more time for discussion or parts that you wished I had speeded up? Getting that kind of feedback would be very, very helpful. Uh, accomplish the objectives. That's a good evaluative question. Did we accomplish what we set out to do? And finally, the last one, do we identify what's coming up next and what we're going to do next? So that's an example of criteria for evaluating meetings. Um, I, the next slide, if we can go to the next one, please, evaluation questions. These are some examples that I use that I share with uh, boards when I do board training. If you don't typically evaluate your board meetings, sometimes it's good to start the process by having the board chair start with himself or herself and simply ask a question, what could I do to make the next board meeting more valuable to you? And insist that people give you feedback. The executive director can do the same thing. The executive director can say to the board, Part of my job is to make sure you all are well informed. I put the board packet together two weeks ago. I, w I want your feedback. Is it, is it a good packet? Is there too much information? Is there not enough? Um, would you like it in more summary form? Is there something I'm not giving you that, that I should be giving you? Give me some feedback on how I can improve the way I keep you informed. So, so these are just some examples of ways to bring more of kind of an evaluative mindset or an evaluative culture into your board meetings. Uh, uh, here's a, another slide that's a tool, an evaluation tool. Uh, and I like to kind of look at this for a minute because it, it's a good way to think about meetings. So the first question, the items we covered today, on a scale from one to four, were they less important? On the one end, all the way up to are they essential? Did we talk about things that were absolutely essential, or did we talk about things that weren't that important? And to get some feedback from the board about what the board's perceptions are on that. The material we provided, was it helpful, or was it not helpful, or was it absolutely indispensable? Indispensable meaning this meeting would not have been productive without it. Not helpful means we really never referenced it. It didn't have anything to do with what we were talking about. Getting feedback about this is a good way to ensure that the board gets the right information it needs so we can make good decisions. Um, and then the third dark and uh, highlighted one, today's discussion concerned primarily operations versus policy and strategy. If we spend too much time talking about operations, we're no longer governing. Um, and then the other kind of questions, what might we have done differently to improve the meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a tool, and it's adapted from uh, Richard uh, Chait and um, and from that book, um, How to Help Your Board Govern. Um, just an example of a, of, a, of a tool, an example of a way of thinking about board meetings in terms of evaluation. And if we shift to the next slide, this is another tool. Um, and I apologize if the, if the font is a little small. I, I, it's the best I could do with this. But this is an example, just an example of a tool that you could use um, if you were running out of time at a board meeting and you really wanted some feedback, the board chair could simply pass this out to people and say, take a minute and respond. And there are just some examples of the kind of questions you might ask around the agenda. Was it clear? Did you get it in time? Um, were the reports uh, clear? Um, those are the kind of things uh, members participate, participated responsibly. You know, do we do okay on that, or do we need to improve the way we do that? And if we need to improve, what do you suggest we do? And that's what I like about this particular tool, because it asks the question, it asks you to evaluate whether you think we did okay or not, but then it also says, what could we do better? And that's the, that's the data, that's the feedback that's going to improve meetings going forward. So that's just another example of a tool. There are all kinds of tools. Um, there's no uh, perfect tool. All you need is a tool that's pretty good, a tool that will give you feedback that is useful, that you can take 
and consider and improve the way you do your board meetings. And the last slide, finally, then, is just sharing your thoughts and reflections. Um, I want to, again, reiterate that this was a little awkward uh, doing this with a technical problem. I hope that the information was valuable. I wish it could have been uh, an interactive session. Um, I am open to interacting, and my email address is right on the screen there in blue, so please feel free to reach out to me. Um, the next uh, webinar in the series is going to be the fourth Thursday in July, July 21st at 4 p.m., and I think uh, at some point Kimberly or Chelsea will put that up on the screen for you all if it's not there already. Um, and that's going to be about management teams, about looking at the kind of leadership teams, and, and it's going to be more oriented towards staff than to board work. But you may find some application for your board work as well. Uh, so with that, again, I will thank you all uh, for participating. I hope you found this valuable. Please respond to the evaluation form and give us your best feedback. We, we will take and listen to everything you have to say. Thank you again to uh, Chelsea and to Kimberly, and I think I will turn it back over to you all. Hi, thank you, thank you everybody for your patience. We did experience some technical delay today in our webinar, but we still want to thank you for, again, being patient with us and staying on the webinar, and hopefully you're taking home some valuable information from this. Save the date, please, July 21st at 4 o'clock p.m., Executive Director's Training Series Part 4, Learning How to Build an Effective Management Team. Once again, you can look out for a follow-up email Bye-bye.